Uh, then what happened? The IRA as, and the British are masters uh, at propaganda. The British make them look like just horrible, horrible people. And you know what? They were. They would, you know, car bombings, guerrilla war tactics, a lot of innocent people die. And they talk about, you know, 3,000 casualties over the years, which is a lot in a place that small, but they also forget to tell you that half those are inflicted by the loyalists or by the British Army. But the IRA gets the reputation uh, of as a you know, terrorist, as we would look on in the Middle East today, Hamas kind of thing. And um, they have a think tank over there with MI6, and they say, you know what we got to do? They put them in the Mays prison, and they had what they called special status category. In other words, prisoners of war. The guys who were captured uh, and so forth, the guys who were taken into prison, or the guys who were there with uh, just because they were there, you know, they, you, didn't, you don't have to press charges, um, were on special status category which meant they were not considered criminals. So they could wear their own clothes uh, and they could be treated like prisoners of war. Uh, in 1978, as Maggie Thatcher starts to, the Iron Lady, starts to come to power, the MI6 think tank says, you know what we gotta do? Take away special category status and criminalize all of these guys. They're criminals is what they are. And so they began a rhetoric not the IRA, but the godfathers of the IRA, the racketeers of the Catholic community, the drug dealers. And they started this rhetoric. And um, they said, if you are thrown into the Mays prison, which is just outside of Belfast, uh, you will be considered a criminal prisoner after 1978. And the first guy that came under that was a kid by the name of Kieran, C-I-A-R-I-N, Nugent. And they said, here, put on your prison uniform. And he said, what? Put on your prison uniform. You are a criminal. He said, no, I'm a prisoner of war. I'm a member of the Irish Republican Army. And he said, put on your prison uniform. And he said, you, <laughs> he said, you guys must be balling me. And he refused. And they said, then you go naked. And he said, fine. And thus begins the blanket protest. All he had was a blanket. Then the prisoners who would come in would, would follow Nugent's example. And they would say, and by the way, we should have the dignity of wearing our clothes to go to the, to the uh, bathroom. And they said, no. And so then we begin the dirty protest. And they would go to the bathroom in their rooms. They would take their feces and throw them on the wall in protest. And all they had was one washcloth and a blanket. Now the maze and, and, the, and the H blocks they built about 10 of these, and they're long prison cells this way and this way, and in the middle, they're connected with a little, uh, uh, with a kitchen and a, a little place for uh, uh, medicine and stuff like that. And so then the H blocks become the focus of the dirty protest. And um, the IRA has a very nasty reputation, and nobody thinks very well of them. What are they going to do? The world looks on us as terrorists. We are trying to fight our freedom. We've been held down for so damn long. What are we going to do? Well, they get the idea, gentlemen, and I mentioned it yesterday, a hunger strike. In Ireland, hunger strikes are a long tradition. McSweeney, and what happened in, in Celtic Ireland? If I cheated you out of two cows, and I'm the richest farmer there, and I say, tough. The recourse you could take would be to come to my house, sit in front of it, and partake of a hunger strike until I gave justice to your claims. And hunger strike struck fear in the hearts of the people because if you died on my doorstep, we all believed that your ghost would haunt me and my family for years to come. And so they would usually give in. The hunger strike had the same power as excommunication used to have in Holy Mother Church because extra ecclesium nulla salvatio est. Remember that? Outside the church, there's no salvation. If you're excommunicated, you have to have the sacraments to be saved, and therefore, you go to hell. And kings would be brought to their knees. Thomas Becket. 
And so um, they said, we, we got to go on a hunger strike. Now, um, the first hunger strike occurred in 1980. And they figured, you know what? We got to win the hearts and minds of the people back. We've got somehow to show them that we are sincere and our cause is just. As they begin the first hunger strike in 1980, Cardinal O'Fee and Bishop uh, Daly intervene, two Catholic churchmen of high rank. And he said, look, we can negotiate this. And they negotiate with the British and say, look, they had five demands. We want to wear our own clothes. Okay, not prison clothes. We will not do prison work because then we're serving the crown. We'll clean our own dishes. We'll clean our own latrines, but we won't make tea for the warders. We won't wash their clothes because then we're serving the king. And they said, no, no, you got to do prison work. Uh, they want it remand reinstated. And the rule in England is for every six months you serve, they'll take six months off your sentence. Well, these guys were revolting, so they took away that right. And then they also wanted uh, letters and visits. And they had cut that off. Those were the five demands. Not much on the surface, but everything symbolically. Because then they could keep their special status prisoner of war state. And the hunger strike went on for about 50 days. And finally, the two churchmen, the cardinal and the bishop, brokered a peace. And the British said, all right, they can wear their clothes on some days and so forth. What the two churchmen didn't realize is the British were totally insincere. And they just wanted the hunger strike stopped. And as soon as it would stop, they would, they would renege. Uh, so they went off the hunger strike. And um, it was okay for a few days, but then they said they had to wear their prison clothes on weekdays and they could wear their uh, regular clothes on the weekends. And no. What fine, but, well, maybe we can negotiate that. What broke it, of all things, and it's always something like this, was underwear. The um, warders said they had to wear prison underwear. And, you know, they said, what do you mean? That's prison clothes. We won't do it. And the, and the negotiations broke down. And everybody, the British are pretty happy. We fooled them. Look, at they stopped it. And they said, no, this time is for real. Enter Bobby Sands. Bobby Sands will be, become an incredible international figure. <laughs>